rooms is. I'll pick up that. Is that all right? Yeah, but where are you going to be microphone? <laughs> Get your wallet out, Rob. <laughs> And the cat and all of Forgive me, forgive me, Lord. How do we get back after that? Read Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. We're going to read the story of Joseph. Just looking at, again, at, at, at relationships. It says this. Oh, back before I do that, I want to put two verses up on the screen. I said that on our relationship cruise, folks, there are two verses that should guide our, our relationships that we walk, walk in. The first one is this. From Proverbs 14, there is a path that seems right before each person, but it ends in death. That verse scares me, folks, because as we walk through life, do you know what? There are things to me that seem so right. There are things to me that think, wow, surely this is the right thing to do. But the Bible says there are some things in life, and if we walk in them, it'll only lead to death. That's why we need the right relationships around us to be able to guide and steer us through difficult times. Let me also put this verse up that's going to guide us more today. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Amen? Listen, in relationships, folks, we need to be guided by God's words. Who we do life with, we need to be guided by God's principles. Who we stay away from, we need to be guided by God's principles in his word. But let's get on to Genesis 37, verse 1. It says this about Joseph. Jacob, uh, and Jacob, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Oh, well, what a... He was off to a bad start straight away, wasn't he? Landed his big, big brothers in, in, in trouble with his, with his dad. You know, he's off to a bad start relationally already. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to, to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. And could not speak a kind word to him. So he's got relationship problems going on at home already with his brothers. Verse 5, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field. When suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. God, this guy's a dreamer. He had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. In other words, you brothers are going to be da bowing down to me. I don't know how you do sort of family counselling or anything like that. But Joseph had obviously not spoken to anyone about how he should interact with his brothers and the rest of his family. Can you imagine that? You saying that to your other brothers and sisters? Especially if you were the youngest ones? I don't know if I would be allowed in the home Later that night, I think I'd be sleeping out in the car park. He was cruising for a bruising. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground, bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Amen. Do you know what? Joseph had a dream. Joseph had a dream. And I think when he had this dream it given to him from God, I wonder if he thought his dream would go something like this. You know, a great dream where everyone would bow down to him. I wonder if he would start off with that dream and next would come a bit of support around him so that he could grow with his skills. Maybe next it would become the opportunity for him to develop. Maybe after that he'd get the promotion. And after that, eventually, he'd be at the palace where everyone would be bowing down to him. But do you know what actually happened to Joseph and how his life actually turned out? This is what happened. 
Instead of once he had his dream, he went through betrayal. He went to slavery. He was put in prison. But then, even after those things, he still ended up in the palace. That does not make sense. When God gives us a dream, don't we think it's going to go like that? Don't you think it's going to go really smoothly so that you can go from one stage to the next step to the next sin until all of a sudden you're there at the palace and you'll have great relationships? But yeah, for Joseph, God gave him a dream and he ended in the pit. God gave him a dream, gave him a dream where his brothers and his family would be bowing down to him. The sun and the moon would even be bowing down to him. But he got sold into slavery. He had this dream in his heart, but instead of being in the palace, he was in the prison. And yet, it took him a long time to get to the palace. I wonder how many of us would say, hey, there's a dream in my heart of something that I would love to happen. Maybe it's a dream relationally, maybe it's a dream of your work life or a dream of your family, something like that. But I wonder how many of us perhaps are in the betrayal stage or in the prison stage. How many of us are perhaps, maybe it just feels like we're in the pit. We're in the pit and we think the palace looks so distant, so far off. How on earth is it going to come to pass? Do you know what? There are some things that God allows in life because it's the only thing that will help us move on. Joseph would have stayed at home all his life. Most probably, unless his brothers had betrayed him. He would have never been able to reach the foreign land, the land of Egypt, where he eventually was promoted uh, and eventually uh, went to the palace and became the leader of uh, the prime minister of, of Egypt. He would have never got that place unless he, he'd have been betrayed by his brothers. Do you know that? He, he'd have never been there. Sometimes the worst relational devastation, folks, causes us to land up on our God-given destiny. Do you know what? Sometimes when you go through hell relationally, maybe through trauma, sometimes those are the only things that will cause us to move on. You know, those are the only things that will cause us to get going. The only things that will cause us to, to move beyond where we are and seek God in a different place. Seek God in a foreign land. Seek God where we never thought he, he would be. That's exactly what Joseph did. But you know what he says about Joseph? As you go through those a couple of chapters about Joseph's life, it says this through the betrayal, through the slavery, through the prison. It says these words, and God was with him. God was with him. Let me tell you some things that went, went on in Joseph's life uh, through, through, through those experiences. It says this, Joseph found favor with his master when he was being, when he was in prison. All that Potiphar owned was placed under Joseph's authority when he was in a foreign land. His master saw that the Lord was with him the Lord made everything that Joseph did a success. The Lord granted him favor with the prison warden. And you know what? He did all these things. And the Bible says this, as he served. As he served God in a foreign land, after being in a pit, after being rejected by his family, after being sold into slavery, as he served, not in the palace when things were great, but in the pit. When things were depressing, in slavery, when there was just bondage, in a foreign land, when his family was so far away from him, he chose to serve God there when he thought no one was looking. And yet God was with him. Do you know what? Sometimes I think very often we would rather a good situation without God than a bad situation with God. Do you know what? I think it's very often we're quite happy just to trundle through life and it might be good, you know, we might have decent relationships, we might have things that are going okay all around, but it's, yeah, yeah, they're good and smiling. But is God there? Yeah, yeah, things are okay on the outside, things look alright. Can I say, the story of Joseph teaches us that it's better to be in a bad situation with God than in an average situation without God. Do you know that that's true for your life and my life? You know what, sometimes 
through the worst of situations, through the through betrayal, through, through people leaving you, through, through people accusing you. Do you know what? God can be with you in those moments more than, than when everything's going hunky-dory. And I think sometimes in life we need God to shake things up. That's exactly what he did for Joseph. Joseph would have never chosen this path where his family betrayed him and walked away from him, left him for dead. But you know what? It was that that got him to the palace. It was that that got him to the dream that he had in his heart. And I want to say this, for people who maybe just feel like they're going relationally through situations that feel like you're in prison or in slavery or, or, or in betrayal, do you know what this? God is watching how you handle it. God is watching how, how you handle these times and these times of difficulty where things do not go your way. And he's, and he's looking at things like your character. We talked about the first week of, on, on the relationship where, where when things don't go our way, there are certain ingredients in relationships that, that we need. If they're going to last, we need character. We need sacrifice. We need to put others first. We, we need integrity. Even if you are in prison, even if you're in, in slavery, even if you're in a difficult place now, hey, what does God want you to do there? Can I say, I think God wants you to keep serving. God wants to keep you walking with him through every season of life. But I wrote down here one, one thing that, if there's one thing that the enemy wants us to wants to throw at us on our relationship, then if there's one missile that I think the enemy tried to throw at Joseph as he was left for dead, as he, by his brothers, as he was betrayed, and as he was acu wrongfully accused by, by his master's wife of, of trying to assault her, if there's one thing that the enemy was trying to throw at, at, at Joseph, it, it was this. It was the missile of unforgiveness. It was the missile of unforgiveness. If there's one thing that can destroy your purpose in life, if there's one thing that can destroy your relationships, it's unforgiveness. Joseph had plenty of opportunities not to forgive his brothers. You know that. He had an opportunity not to forgive his father, to, 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 to show unforgiveness to his father, his master's wife. The, the chief cupbearer, remember him in the story, who forgot about Joseph when he was in prison and promised that he, he'd tell, the, tell Pharaoh about him. Just another word, we could have been unforgiven, and he could have shown unforgiveness, but Joseph didn't do that. Do you know what? Unforgiveness comes at us like a missile daily. Do you know that? As you go through life, do you know, I've just found it really easy to get ticked off with people. Do you know what? I don't know, maybe it's just age. Maybe, maybe now I've hit 35. I'm just thinking, little things bug me. Things that didn't used to bug me, I'm just getting grouchy in my old age. I said this before, pray for Gemma. <laughs> pray for me. I just get grouchy in my old age. Why did they totally say that? Why did, they, why did they go there? Why did they do this? Why did they, did they say that? And I can get really little grouchy. You know, we've got, we've got children at home and how quickly can we just get offended by small stuff? How quickly can we jump to conclusions at work? How quickly can we be, can we take offence at something that's said uh, about us? Anyone else just feel it really easy to get offended these days? Just really easy to get offence. To take offense. And I've got to be careful, folks, that it doesn't get into my heart. Because unforgiveness is one of the main missiles that the enemy will launch against you and against me. Jesus had a lot to say about forgiveness and having unforgiveness in our heart. Peter went up to Jesus one day and he said this, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, Peter, think again. Try 70 times seven times. Now for all of those of you here, I've done the math already, that's 490 times. Now what Jesus was saying was that you don't have to keep forgiving when you get to 491. You can hold a grudge then. You can take that to heart and you can be bitter for the rest of your life. But what Jesus was saying to Peter was this, that your forgiveness needs to be unlimited. And that's really hard because last week I talked to you about relationships that needed to end and relationships that we're good to walk away from. But if we're going to survive, if our relationships are going to thrive, folks, we need to be people who overflow with forgiveness. We need to be people who forgive quickly. 
and unlimited, and, and forgiveness, that forgiveness should come and be unlimited from our hearts. John Hopkins made, made an article published this um, did a survey into forgiveness and the benefit of it on our health. It was an article titled Forgiveness, Your Health Depends on It. And they did it. They surveyed loads of people, did health tests, did hooked them up to machines and things like that, and they found that this chronic anger puts you into fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and immune response. Who just thought it? I thought that was just cake that did that. <laughs> Apparently not anger as well. Those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, diabetes, among other conditions. Can I say that the missile of unforgiveness can put you in an early grave? It can put your spiritual life in an early grave as well. Because unless we come to God and forgive people who need forgiving, and I know this is hard because some of you have been hurt. And it's easier to hold on to that hurt than let it go. But we've got to be a people who keep forgiving. There's nothing inherently wrong with being angry, you know that. But in Ephesians, in Ephesians 4, 26, 27, it says this, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Do you know what? I like being angry sometimes. I feel self-righteous. I feel like I'm right, and they are wrong, and I am going to jolly tell them about it. And it, there's a time for being angry, folks, but there's also a time for not sinning as well because of our anger. How often does our anger lead us onto a conversation where things get out of hand and things just snowball and before long we've done things that we, we regret? But in our anger, Paul says to, to the Ephesian church, do not sin. Do not sin, do not hold on to unforgiveness, do not hold on to hurts. Not only, and I put this down, not only does your, does, does, are we, not only does anger and unforgiveness hurt your relationship with others, folks, but it hurts our relationship with God. Forgiveness is a huge deal to God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, it says this. If you do not, and this is where the rubber hits the road, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's tough. Because we say, we say God's grace, His mercy are free. They are limited. But sometimes... Our grace and mercy and our forgiveness towards others runs out. We need to be a people who keep on forgiving. forgiving. It, Jesus put it in the Lord's Prayer, didn't he? He said, he said forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And I wonder what Joseph's, what Joseph thought. Now he's in the palace. Now Joseph, Joseph has become the prime minister of Egypt. He, he's in on his throne. And all of a sudden, the brothers that betrayed him come in because they need food. They need food. And Joseph goes through a process with them of sending them back to Canaan, bringing back a brother, sending them away again, bringing them back, accusing them to test who they are right now. And now Joseph is face to face with his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, and he's got an opportunity to put the knife in. Anyone here just love an opportunity to put a knife in and, you know, bit, dig up. Not, not physically, okay? But, you know, a little, get someone over on that, you know, just give me two minutes and I'm that person and I'll sort them out, Lord. <laughs> just give me, give me a break for five minutes, Lord, and I'll give another piece of my mind. <laughs> Joseph could have done that. He was the main guy in the country of Egypt. He had all the weapons that he needed to. He, can I say this? He was justified. Joseph was justified in, acute, in going for his brothers because of what they had done to him. They left him in a pit to die, ruined his life, told his father that, that he was left for dead. Joseph had the, I want to say, it was almost as if he had the right to do wrong. This is what he did in chapter 50, verse 12. When his brothers aren't sure how they're going to treat him. When his brothers come before him begging him for mercy, he says this to them. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, 
but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. What a way to build a relationship. What a way not to hold a grudge. He says, I'll care for your children and your children's children. Not because you deserve it, but because God has been so gracious and so merciful to me. I want to just give you three things. How you can disarm the missile of unforgiveness in your life. Because I think far more people carry unforgiveness than we know about it. Far more people hold on to things and hurts and harms that they've had than to them. Let me give you three things that you can disarm, disarm the missile of unforgiveness before it does any more damage in your life. The first thing is this, that we need to repent before God. We need to repent before God. It's not just about sinning against the person. We need to come before God and say, God, I'm trying to take your place in this situation. I've tried to bring justice about myself. I've tried to, I've tried to do it my way, but it's not the right way. If you're harboring bitterness towards someone, then first repent to God. Forgiveness, unforgiveness isn't a problem, folks. Unforgiveness is a sin. Unforgiveness is a sin. The second thing is this: release the offender from your judgments. Do you know what? When we when we keep Judgment in our hearts towards someone, someone who's done us wrong and we think we're going to get them back. Do you know what we're actually doing in those moments? We're actually playing God. Because rather than releasing them to God's judgment and God's um, hands, we're actually saying, let's, let's, I'll be in the place of God and I'll decide what the punishment is going to be. We need to get out of that, folks, and release them to God. Release the offender from your judgment. The first, third thing is this. Bless the offender until your feelings change. You know, sometimes we've just got to we just got to be kind until things change. So sometimes we've just got to we've just got to show grace. Sometimes we've just got to show show mercy towards others until things start to change in our hearts. Jesus said this: Love your enemies, do good to those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. If you fight fire with fire, folks, you'll end up with a bigger fire. You know that you will fight if you fight hate with hate and expect a bigger problem. Defeat it with the opposite spirit. Pray that God would bless them until the negative spirit is off you. No, oh, I just went there here this morning. How many people would say, "Hey, God, perhaps I'm in the pit. Perhaps in life." Maybe I had a dream that didn't work out as I thought it was going to. Maybe things just relationally have left you in, in, in a pit. And you just feel broken. Can I say, when, when you're in a pit, there's only one thing that you can do. And it's look up. And often it's Jesus who is there wanting to help or wanting to come to your aid. As you... Maybe you're sitting here this morning as well. Maybe it's just a sense of God, Rob, on the outside, it, it looks like I'm in the palace, everything's going well. But inwardly, I'm going through some pit moments. I'm going through some pit moments where I'm broken, where I feel like I've been betrayed, been put in prison, just in slavery to things that are binding me relationally. And although maybe on the outside things are looking okay, inwardly I'm just wasting away. Can I encourage you this morning? Don't quit in the pit. Don't quit in the pit of your life. Because as Joseph would tell us, hey, sometimes we get to the palace. So an unexpected route. Should we pray?